I can't think about it on my own. But sometimes, the spirits that these children sense can be bothersome. When I try to do my homework, sometimes he like pulls on my pants legs and like tries to get my attention. And during school, sometimes I feel him like twirling with my hair and poking me. It's, it's kind of annoying. Psychic children often see auras or energy fields around people. I've been seeing auras since I was very little. In class, I find that it's good to turn off auras or dim it down a bit so I'm not like looking at all the pretty colors around everyone going, ooh. <laughs> How prevalent is the phenomenon of psychic ability in children? No one knows for sure. But from my experience, children are much more open to psychic. They don't have our adult skepticism and um, disbelief. Ready? Amen. As part of her research, Dr. Drews tests children to see if they're psychic. With young children like Eleanor, Dr. Drews uses five different colored candies. She encourages the child to guess which color she is pulling out of the bag. To get statistically significant results, they repeat the exercise 25 times. If you get a high number, or say six, seven, eight, or even higher, it indicates that something more than just chance is, is operating, that the, there is a likelihood that the child has some ability to tune in to information in their, in their environment on a paranormal level, perhaps as we would say at a psychic level. Eleanor ended up scoring a five, which means she may not be psychic at all. That's what you'd expect with chance. What color? Dr. Drew says she can assess children as young as three or four, as long as they can point to the colors and understand her directions. Brown. Brown. Though sometimes it can be quite challenging. Mm -hmm. Guess which color? Brown. Okay, ready, what color? I said brown for the God no. Lord. Okay, I have cards that have each of these symbols. Certain to determine if older children, like 12-year-old Elizabeth Landrum, are psychic, Dr. Drews uses a special deck of cards called Zener cards. The deck consists of 25 cards with five different symbols. I came to pick a certain shape by seeing it in my mind's eye and feeling it with my gut. Ready? Star. I would feel that I did get it, or I would feel that I didn't get it. Circle. Elizabeth scored above chance, which came as no surprise to her mother, Peggy. From the time she was born, I felt we had a telepathic connection. If I were singing a song silently inside of my head, all of a sudden she would sing it out loud. I could do the same thing with her. That's because Peggy has psychic abilities herself. Experts say it's a gift that has been known to run in families. The research is not definitive about that, whether there's a genetic component or not. I tend to see from the reports I get and the testing that I do that indeed there are family members that also have psychic abilities. Growing up, Elizabeth has always had a very strong connection with nature. I've been able to talk to trees as long as I can remember. This used to be a pasture where cows grazed, and she was the wolf tree, yeah. the tree that gave the cows the shade. shade. Yeah. And uh, we would often take walks in the woods, and she would ask trees questions, and she would get the answer to her questions from, from the trees. Though this may seem far-fetched, the ability to commune with nature is common for psychic children. I've heard from other children that they're much more sensitive on a different vibration almost uh, to the world around them. They were building a house next door to us. That was hard because they were chopping down so many trees and it was very hard for me when that happened. Large-scale disasters like Hurricane Katrina are also very hard for Elizabeth. When Katrina was happening, I was extremely depressed. I felt like I was in this dark pit with water coming in. It was this awful feeling. With her extreme sensitivity, 
Elizabeth also picks up on other people's feelings. It's very confusing, and sometimes you'll just wake up and feel depressed, and you won't know why, or you'll feel extremely happy. By now, I know my child, and I'll say to her, Elizabeth, are they really your feelings, or are they someone else's feelings? And it's hard because it sets your own feelings off balance, and it makes you even more sensitive. So being in a regular school sometimes can be very overwhelming for these children. I'd come to pick her up at school and she would have huge dark circles under her eyes and just dragging her book bag, just completely exhausted. And I thought, you know what? This isn't working out for this kid. This experience is just eating her up. It also didn't help that Elizabeth's classmates were making fun of her. And I was always being teased. I have a birthmark on my ankle, a brown birthmark, and it's known as the girl who could talk to trees with a freaky birthmark on her ankle. It was really hard. So for the past five years, Peggy has been homeschooling her. It was a lot of one-on-one -on -one teaching and learning, but she seemed to thrive on it because she had a lot of alone time, quiet time, peace. And in the process, Peggy has helped Elizabeth come to terms with her gift. She reassured me that I would find people like this when I was older, because there aren't many people my own age that can understand how I feel. But one who does is 10-year-old Madison Smith. Madison was five, her mother Twyla remembers, when they were driving to the wedding of a man whose first wife, Robin, had died of cancer. She never really met her because she was a tiny baby. And Madison asks from the back seat, you know, oh, was Robin a man or was she a woman? Robin, um, she was a woman, why do you ask? And she said, well, why is she bald? And I got all excited thinking, oh my gosh, how would she even know anything about Robin? And so I said, is she happy? She said, Mom, she's dead. And there were more surprises to come. Later that year, Madison got sick at school one day. The date was September 10th, 2001. I went to the nurse and said, oh, I feel crummy. I feel like everyone hates me. I feel like I'm going to throw up. I feel like I'm going to die. So I went and I got her, and I laid her on the couch and gave her a wet washcloth on her head and said, well, you know, OK, whatever. And then the next day, September 11th happened. So Maddie's sensitivity and reaction, she couldn't identify it. She wasn't able to tune into it, indicated that she was probably picking up on something about that horrific day. But it's not only disasters that Madison can sense. Her abilities also affect her everyday life, like on her birthday when she often sees her present before she actually receives it. She was just trying to get me surprised about the dog, and I'm like, oh, there's this dog here. I was, like, acting so excited. I knew it was going to happen. It takes some of the surprise out of life. I try to be just supportive and affirming. Like, I neither say, ooh, that means you're psychic, or go the other direction and say, oh, it's all in your mind. Don't talk about it. It just is. And Madison's psychic gifts are shared by children across the country. In Phoenix, Arizona, being psychic is a family affair. We can never really hide anything from my mom. She kind of knows before we even tell her. In this house in Phoenix, Arizona, Deborah Martin lives with her husband, Rick, their four-year-old daughter, Allison, and Deborah's three children from a previous marriage, Stephen, 21, Stephanie, 18, and Brad, 16. At first glance, they seem like an ordinary American family. And they are, <laughs> except for one thing. I married a medium. They have, like, we're gonna get, like, sheepskin. When I first met Debbie, she did not mention her psychic abilities to me. In fact, I think she wanted to surprise me with them after we were married. <laughs> um, it's... For the children, it's, it's not always easy like, having a medium for a mother. I want to get more accomplished. We can never really hide anything from my mom. She kind of knows before we even tell her. 
But more often than not, her psychic senses can be a bonus, especially when it comes to dating. My mother always has guided me in my social life. And she lets me kind of do my own thing when I like want to date and like who I want to date. But unless she gets a really bad aura about them, she kind of tells me how she feels about me dating that person. And as it turns out, Deborah's not the only one in the family with psychic ability. Some of her children are already beginning to show the signs, especially the youngest two, Allison and Brad. He can see the spirits' faces. Sometimes I'll see them, but I'll see them more in my mind. I get a little jealous at times because he's so much more visual. Look at the pajamas. Oh, those and are even at age four, Allison's gifts are apparent. She's seeing spirits and communicating with spirits as if it's another person right next to her. She's actually going to be a lot better than me and my mom could ever even dream of being. Deborah believes that her own father, Frank, was also psychic. I also believe that that was hard for him. He didn't understand the voices that were happening into his mind, almost where it kind of drove him crazy. In 1987, three years after the death of his wife, Frank committed suicide. He was 58. And it's Frank that all her children have reported seeing, including Deborah's oldest children, Stephanie and Stephen. Although Stephen was only three when Frank died, he says he still sees him but Stephen sees Frank as a man much younger than he actually knew. Skinny face, uh, reddish hair, same kind of nose. Stephen's description of her father surprised Deborah. I didn't even know that he had any ability. It was comforting to know that he is seeing and my father is with him. Even though Stephanie never met her grandfather, they share a special bond. Stephanie was born six weeks early and arrived on Frank's birthday. So I kind of feel every time that I have a birthday, I blow up the candles for the two of us. Frank came through to Stephanie for the first time a year ago. It happened when she was at the dentist's office, getting her wisdom teeth out. And it was my first time going under, and I was very, 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 very scared. Go ahead and put the mask on and just take some nice deep breaths. And I had my mom stay in the room with me until I was completely out. And if you want, you can count backwards from 10. As I was waking up, I started crying to my mom, saying, don't go away, don't let him go away. I don't want to wake up. I don't want him to go away. And my mom's like, you don't want who to go away? And I said, my grandpa, he's here. He held my hand the whole time through. It truly touched her in a way that was comforting. So I think. When she's ready and she's more mature, she will probably open up and let it happen. I'm seeing that your dad has short, short brownish hair. It's but Deborah's youngest son, Brad, is different. It's, I heard that very loud. He's been opening up his psychic energies all his life. Brad came to me one morning when he was four years old, and he said that there were two people standing at the end of his bed and he described my parents to a T. Spirits have been pestering Brad ever since. They won't let me sleep sometimes. Sometimes I'll just be laying in bed, and I'll just, like, I have to turn on the TV and watch TV in order to ignore it. Brad can see auras or energy fields. To help Brad develop this ability, Deborah invited Dr. Hi. Melinda Connor to work with him. Dr. Connor is a clairvoyant trained in clinical psychology and neuropsychology. As I understand it, you have already started to do some work, yep. right? Yep. And tell me a little bit about where you are in the process. I've been seeing aura since I was born. I mean, I just thought that was normal. It's just like um, kind of like long strands or big blobs of just color. Yes. But then you'll start they'll start to see like a human form into the colors. Most people start out seeing a shimmer, much like heat coming off of a road. It looks like a shimmer coming off of the body. I can see more of like shoulders and more, okay. more um, legs and more facial like nose and eyes and mouth. Okay. It's we should also practice some with playing going internal into the body because okay. that can be really cool too. You can actually watch the heartbeat and stuff like that. 
I was able to layer through like the skins and the muscles, like an MRI scan. I was able to do that with my head, which actually kind of freaked me out. Brad is putting his ability to read auras to great advantage. For the past year, he's been treating injuries as a student sports trainer at his local high school. Football player will walk in with a, a hurt neck or hurt shoulder, and I'll see a big color by their shoulder or their neck, and I know right away what's hurting, how it's hurting, how bad the pain is. And his special talent has not gone unnoticed. I've heard of him like predicting injuries before soccer games. Like he predicted that a couple of people would get bloody noses, and they did. I noticed he's been a quick study. He's got a knack for doing a good job in student training and just been able to pick up the trade very quickly. But until recently, they didn't know why. I learned about his psychic abilities about a week ago. I found it surprising because I've never actually heard of anyone doing this before. If he has that extra ability to see more than the normal person, that would be huge, and that would just make him that much better, and it would make him obviously very special in this field. I want to be a surgeon, for sure. And there aren't many surgeons who can psychically see the inside of the body like Brad can do. Coming up, this teenager amazes adults with her readings. Where there was always a, a kind of separation between you and your father, it still affects you now. I've never had a reading by anybody so young. It was pretty dead on. In the Martin household in Phoenix, Arizona, Deborah and her older children are not the only ones in the family with psychic abilities. They believe that the youngest, four-year-old Allison, also has the gift. She'll come into our room saying that during her sleep or right when she wakes up that someone else is in her room. And she'll say, well, the spirits are, she calls them souls. The souls are being too loud. And not only is she psychic, Deborah thinks that Allison is also what some experts in parapsychology call a crystal child. Author Doreen Virtue is the foremost authority on crystal children. Crystal children are very young, very intuitive, psychic, and highly sensitive people. You can recognize the crystal children from their big eyes, and they stare right into you as if they can see the depths of your soul. Crystal children often communicate with their parents even before they're born. When I married Rick, I started seeing this little girl, and I said, Rick, you know, we're going to have this little girl, and I described her. She pictured her with long blonde hair standing next to our bed, which was kind of unique. All our kids have dark hair, freckles. I didn't expect this child that she's seeing being so completely different. After Allison was born, she had trouble learning to talk. But delayed speech is not unusual for crystal children. These children don't talk because they have a higher way of communicating, and that's mind-to-mind -mind communication. Time to wake up. We kind of know what, what each other is thinking and what each other needs, and it becomes like habit. So I don't even know I'm doing it or what she's doing, but we know if she looks at me with a certain smile, we make that connection eye to eye. Like many children, Allison enjoys playing in her room by herself. But unlike most children, Allison may not be playing alone. And what's amazing to me is she's standing there and she looks like she's performing to someone. And then she'll start laughing at herself as if somebody's laughing at her and they're laughing together. Allison often tells her mother that there are angels in the room. The angels come when you go to sleep. What do they do? Show me. What do they do when they come and go to, when you go to sleep? They hold my hand. They hold your hand? And make my dreams come true with all the stuff in it. There is also another group of psychic children, older children, that many refer to as indigos. Psychotherapist Julie Rosenshine knows all about indigo children. In her practice in Westchester, New York, she sees many of them. An indigo child is really a child who, even though they're young, they have a very old soul, they have a, they have a wise way about them. They're highly sensitive, even emotionally or physically. Tammy believes that her eight-year-old daughter, Athena, is one of them. If there's a loud noise, she shudders inside. It's not like a small shudder. She shudders inside. 
If she walks outside into the elements, her skin is very sensitive, her body is very sensitive. But what do you call your angels? Um, I have three of them. One's Rose, up here. Yes. One is Bella, and no, that's Annabelle, that's Isabella, and that's Bella. Having angels, having someone on your side, on your team, is a, an amazing, comforting thing if you know what it is. And if you don't know, it could be very scary. Do you hear them or do you more see them? I more see them than hear them. Okay, what do you see when you see angels? Um, I usually see an orb. Okay. For many indigos, this gift can be consuming. They usually are quite stubborn. They want to do things their way. They have a life purpose that's very, very driven. I believe there's always been indigo children on the planet. I think that Joan of Arc was definitely an indigo child. She's classic in that she was getting messages that she said were from God and the angels and saints. And she was called to leadership. You know, she was called to save France. Tom and Margie Bershad have come to believe that their now 18-year-old daughter Sandy is an indigo. When Sandy was just crawling, she would crawl into a room and you could feel the energy just sizzle, basically. Many say that indigos often pick their own parents before they are born. When she was two, we would play prince and princess. And Sandy interrupted play at one point and just blurted out, I chose you as my parents. But for a long time, Sandy's parents didn't know what to do with her, especially when Sandy told them she was seeing different colors around people. She would talk about gray things floating. So of course we would go check it out scientifically and medically. And they basically said, no, she did not have floaters and everything was fine with her eyes. Sandy insisted on sleeping in our room almost every night. She was so insistent about um, being afraid to sleep in her own room. If a child does not know that they're sensing energy or sensing angelic presences, they might have a hard time sleeping at night. We really didn't get it. We didn't understand no. that this whole realm was being sort of perceived by her until much later. I was in a deep, deep depression because I thought no one understood me and I didn't really get along with any of the other kids. When I was in grade school, I didn't do my work. Um, I was quiet, drawn into myself. Sandy definitely was always oppositional, so schools were pretty much throwing their hands up when she was young or not really knowing how to deal with her. These kids are what we call system busters because they're so authentic and they're so honest, they will not disconnect from that honesty and they tell you like it is. Everything began to change for the Bershads after Margie stumbled on an article online that Julie had written about indigo children. Julie had been a highly intuitive child herself and was able to understand children like Sandy. So. Julie was able to give her explanations for things that she was perceiving and then enabled her to connect to her, you know, life force and her goal and gave her a place really on earth to, to proceed. So I guess this mentorship or journey is all about finding who you are within. And um, it's helped me a lot with that and become more confident with myself. It became very clear very quickly how gifted she really was. I think at this point, we're more or less just allowing things to develop, allowing things to occur. That's okay. Um, Sandy's abilities have grown to the point that she now gives personal readings. Readings that are uncannily accurate for a teenager. This is the first time that Sandy has met Melissa. How are you today? I'm pretty good, how are you? I'm very good. i um, a little nervous, but <laughs> I'm excited too. When someone's directly in front of me, I am basically enveloped by their whole energy fields. And I feel like it's just sometimes that you hold back uh, just saying things that you might uh, want to or need to get across and keeps you from having a good outcome in those kinds of situations. Because you hold back this information, you sometimes get this built-up suppression in your chest. 
here's kind of how I uh, think so of it. It's I think like I put up my little antenna up, radio antenna up, and uh, I get a transmission. And you have all this emotional suppression that I feel, and it, you always like collect it right here in your chest. And it's like, oh, I can't breathe anymore. And it, it gets to the point where it, your stress levels go up so much that sometimes you just have these incredible breakdowns. Sandy has picked up on Melissa's panic attacks. I worry myself sick and then I, I feel like there's an elephant sitting on my chest and I can't breathe. And it's usually about like the future events. So. I worry, yeah, I yeah. worry about everything. I like to be in control. Um, I like to have everything my way um, and that's, that's not something I'm proud of. And I get all this information coming into my head, like I'm channeling the information, uh, like a little birdie's whispering it in my ear. <laughs> I see around you um, maybe some ants um, that passed away. Yeah, that's what I'm picking up on. And um, they're all surrounding you right now, and that's, that's really nice. I, I see like, one with a curly brownish hair, and it, she's kind of your guardian and a protector, um, someone you could go to talk to about things, uh, someone that would make you feel comfortable. A lot of the points that she picked up on right away just totally hit me back, and um, I just really thought that she was right on with a lot of the stuff. You said my aunt. I always called her mama. She passed when I was 15, and I, I definitely sense her around me, and um, I just really miss her. I guess another thing I might have been picking up on was a weirdness in the relationship with your father. I feel like there's this separation. Mm -hmm. um, you guys don't talk. And I feel like there must have been some kind of falling out because that happened years ago. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even from the time you were younger. I'm thinking that you're picking up on my biological father. Yeah. Um, I never really knew him my whole life, so. And then I met him and it didn't go well. And yeah. So. I find that there's like this nurturing quality for me and even though I give readings, I want to want to advise as well. I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't resolve it, it's going to follow you throughout the rest of your life. So that should be one of the things that you might want to concentrate on even though it's hard. Sandy's psychic abilities stunned Melissa, particularly because of her age. Normally, people that have the gift are much older. I've never had a reading by anybody so young. That was so, it, it, was, it was pretty dead on. When I get a little bit older, I want to start with counseling on a psychological level and using my spiritual gifts to help me in that way. But there can be a downside to growing up psychic. And no one knows better than a pair of identical twins named Terry and Linda Jameson. It's a tremendous burden to have this gift, to be honest. It is one of the hardest paths one could possibly go. Linda and Terry Jameson are professional psychics who call themselves the Psychic Twins. The Psychic Twins are famous for their predictions, especially the one they made on November 2nd, 1999. We were both in separate rooms and we both wrote through our automatic writing on the same day, we wrote World Trade Center attacks, bin Laden, thousands perish, United American, it was all there. And uh, that very night, we were able to give that information on national radio. We are seeing uh, various terrorist attacks on federal government. And also uh, the New York Trade Center, the World Trade Center in 2002, the twins are also experts who know all about what it really means to grow up psychic and how those psychic abilities can be both a gift and a burden. Yeah, people look at us and they say, oh, you're so lucky, you know, you have so everything going for you, but they have no idea. No the one agony, would want it. <laughs> the agony that our lives really were. They want the gift, but they don't want what went with it. What went with it for them was a long string of illnesses ranging from arthritis to cancer. Their illnesses, they believe, were caused by constantly tapping into other people's negative energies. To this day, Terry and Linda are still plagued by chronic fatigue and debilitating allergies. 
allergies are very common with psychic children of all kinds. So uh, we're very, very allergic to dust and cats and perfume and yes. makeup. Pollen, pollens of all kinds, grasses and name it. Cigarettes. We, <laughs> yeah, we're, we take allergy pills a lot. But for the psychic twins, there's also been an upside, a reward for developing their gift. Terry and Linda have come up with their own version of what's commonly known as automatic writing. The automatic writing is the way that the hand moves without one's conscious direction across the page and writes and writes and writes information that one couldn't possibly know. This is what it looks like. And it's very involved. Most people can't read it. We can read it. Uh, but it looks like a medieval manuscript almost the way it comes in. They use their automatic writing as a way to foresee the future. And the things that they've predicted are absolutely amazing. In 1997, they say they also foresaw another tragedy, the death of John F. Kennedy Jr. We said it right after Lady Di was killed. We said, uh, JFK's going to die uh, in a small plane. He, he's going to be next. And sure enough, just a couple years later, he was killed. You couldn't believe it at first. But then as time went on, they got so many things right. Which was all the more surprising, considering their background. We grew up in a very small country town in Pennsylvania, so no one knew what a psychic was. And growing up, we'd never heard of it. So I think that made it especially hard for us to understand our gifts. Their parents were two artists. Jane and Philip Jamison. Philip Jamison is famous. His watercolors hang in museums and collections all over the world. They also have a brother, Flip, who is two years older and has no psychic ability. From an early age, Linda and Terry loved to paint and draw, working in a way that seems to have foreshadowed their later psychic career. Both Linda and Terry seem to draw automatically. And they did lots of little figures, little figures, little figures, little figures. And they just had a real inspiration for painting. At the East Bradford Elementary School in Westchester, Pennsylvania, the twins were inseparable. The two were meant to be together all their lives. They don't really need anybody else. I think they knew what each other was thinking, and they knew each other so well that they almost lived in the same mind. We absolutely oh, yes. did communicate telepathically from day one with each other in the womb. <laughs> Everything uh, was telepathic with us. However, being telepathic is not particularly uncommon for twins, but being psychic is. We were very, very young when uh, we realized we were not like other children. Terry actually predicted the number of jelly beans at a school fair that were in a jar. I think there were like 537, and she predicted it on the nose, and she was six years old. I just remember being so sure of the number of jelly beans in the jar. It was easy. And I remember being a, a little bit surprised that it was exactly right. Growing up, Terry and Linda had imaginary playmates, and they also saw spirit beings. Almost alien or reptilian. Yeah, very otherworldly types of energies, and they were terrifying to us. But they never told anyone else in their family. It wouldn't have mattered anyway. No one would have known what they were talking about. It was so different from anything we've ever experienced in our life. We've never known anything to do with psychics at all. Even the typical childhood games became something quite different when played by Terry and Linda. We loved stuffed animals, but stuffed animals had real spirits to yeah, us. They were alive. It, they were as alive as real yeah. animals. But as they became teenagers and began attending Henderson High School, they say their health began to deteriorate. You're, you feel Different. everything so much more so than much. anyone else. You're and fielding everybody yeah. else's negativity, sadness, grief, You anger. feel everything from everyone yeah. else. Still, they graduated art school and became artists of another sort, performance artists. 
We've always been looked at as strange, and so we obviously play that off in a big way. We dress alike a lot and we talk alike, but it's just because our life is like a performance piece. It's an ongoing work of art. But as they got into their 30s, the pull to become professional psychics became too great to ignore. Although the automatic writing just came to them, they say, the rest took a lot of hard work and practice. And it wasn't something that just came to us like a flash. We would literally be writing and writing and writing and practicing, watching the crime shows on TV and solving them, getting specifics about who, where, when, where, would, where they would find the bodies, what the name of the criminal was, what his physical description was. Psychic hygiene, how to protect ourselves with white and gold light and not take on so much of people's suffering. We'd be on the floor with just one reading. I thought it was wonderful. I mean, she felt very protected by this guardian angel who would sit at the foot of her bed when she was going to sleep. And he was benevolent and kind and young. But things began to change a year ago, Amelia says. That's when spirits began to contact her. Sometimes Amelia would see them, and sometimes she would just feel them either touching her or breathing close to her. It was very creepy. I'd just be lying in bed trying to get to sleep, and I just, I'd feel something like stroke my head or like pull back my hair or something. And yeah, that was pretty scary. At the center, Amelia and her mother get comfort from others like themselves. It was really wonderful to find out that there's a network of people who have similar experiences. Parents who want to support their children and children who are really extraordinary. Here, children learn to develop their telepathic gifts. One person will choose a stone, put it in their hand, and cover it up, and the other person tries to feel, sense, see, hear, however they connect, what that stone is. I would say about nine out of 10 times that they actually um, are correct. They're practicing what's called linking. Linking is a way of opening up your mind to another person. Yeah! You are able to connect with other people. And linking with the stone is a way to begin that kind of telepathy so that you can communicate with others without having to speak out loud. A lot of them had that ability. They just don't know how to harness it yet. But perhaps the biggest challenge for psychic children is surviving in a world that often doesn't believe they are psychic at all. Unfortunately, mainstream science and psychology and mental health would go more toward the tendency of thinking of it as a mental illness. We're seeing a lot of kids that are being labeled oppositional defiant and bipolar and ADD instead of really looking for the root causes. A lot of the children will drink or do drugs so they don't hear the voices anymore. You just hear spirit talking to you, but society teaches you that this means you're crazy. And society doesn't teach you, except for taking a pill, how to deal with it. And what we do here is we teach the children how to tell them to go away. Parents should treat their psychic child as any other child with an ability in music, art, drama. It's a gift. What I think is important is that these kids are actually saying to us as a society and a culture that the spiritual side of a human being is not something that should be cut off. It's something that needs to be cherished and supported and loved. And these children, if they have that kind of support, they flourish. I don't really think you can categorize my actual gifts. It's gotten to the point where something new pops up every day. Saying things that you might Sandy's know, abilities may be the sort of normal abilities 30 years from now, and it may actually represent sort of an evolutionary step in terms of where we are as, as a human race. Um, I'm extremely lucky to have a mom that helps me so much. Okay. For her to be able to teach me all that, it's amazing because I'm doing something not many people in the world ever get to do. 